Sounds like it's time for our next session, titled Mind, 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 Finding Solutions to Address Aging Water Infrastructure. Few topics are as hotly debated and downright divisive, at least on the state level, as finding a solution to the challenges posed by the San Joaquin Sacramento Delta, the hub of California's water supply. The need for a conveyance system around the Delta has been known since the 1940s. Voters rejected the peripheral canal in 1982, and since then, water leaders, state leaders, and stakeholders have tried to find a delicate balance of water supply and environmental, fish, and wildlife protection. And now, for a decade of formal study and considerations of more than 100 plans, state and federal environmental studies identify the, the Twin Tunnel Project, the California Water Fix, and accompanying Echo Restore as the best plans to accomplish those dual goals of securing a north-south water supply while restoring the Delta habitat. Governor Jerry Brown is behind the plan, so uh, are we closer to a solution? or are we going to, as Dory likes to sing in Finding Nemo, just swimming, just keep swimming? In addition to the California fix, we need to evaluate the conditions of all aging infrastructure that stores and conveys water like Oroville Dam and other dams and reservoirs. Will the new presidential administration fast track funding and authorizations for California water infrastructure projects? Will California get its fair share of the money? Joining us today to speak of these challenges and these issues in order of their appearance Jeffrey Keitlinger, who is General Manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California, who will provide an update on efforts to modernize the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta water system and the California water fix. The Honorable Mike Gatto uh, from California State Assembly uh, and current member of the Delta Stewardship Council is not able to join us today due to a sudden family emergency. We do wish him and his family well. In his place, we have the chair of the Delta Stewardship Council, Randy Fiorini, who has graciously accepted to fill in and provide an update on the council's efforts to implement the Delta plan. Randy's public involvement with water issues began in 1982 when he was elected to be the director of the Turlock Irrigation District. He served in that capacity for 16 years. During that time, he also served as president of the San Joaquin River Group Authority, president of the California Farm Water Coalition, and as president of the Association of California Water Agencies. In March of 2010, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger appointed Randy to serve on the Delta Stewardship Council. He was elected by his colleagues as vice chair at their initial meeting in 2014, and he was elected chair after that point. He was appointed to his position by Governor Jerry Brown in May of 2016. Thank you, sir, for filling in on his behalf. On uh, such short notice, Randy, we appreciate it. Then we're going to hear from David Gutierrez, who is Senior Water Resources and Geotechnical Engineer of GEI Consultants, who will talk about Oroville Dam and the current conditions of California's water infrastructure. During his 37-year career, David has established himself as an expert in water management and dam safety and has created and led some of the most complex water management programs within the state of California for the Department of Water Resources. And lastly, we'll hear from Scott Mason of Holland and Knight, who focuses on the intersection between Capitol Hill and the Trump administration on major policy initiatives, including tax reform, health care reform, infrastructure initiatives, immigration, and other key priorities. Most recently, Mr. Mason served on President Trump's transition team. He will provide an overview of the administration's vision for fast-tracking infrastructure projects. Let's get the session started. Jeff, we'll start with you. Hey, Fritz. Welcome. Good to see you. you just all come on up? Sure. Okay. sure. I did. Nobody wants to sit in the prince's chair. Oh, there we go. All right. I think we're all set. All right. I'll go ahead and stand. Okay. So, Jeff Keitlinger, Metropolitan Water District. Uh, I guess according to Mr. Sedluck, I'd be in the blue chip stock business. What Metropolitan does, of course, is import water from Northern California and the Colorado River to Southern California. And for the last 
25 years, we have uh, been embarked on integrated resources planning and doing that portfolio approach that, uh, that Dr. Sedlick talked about. And there's basically three stools to this approach. Uh, imported water as the backbone of Southern California water, roughly 50, 55 percent of our water comes from those two sources, Colorado River, Northern California. Then the other two uh, legs of that stool have been water conservation, water efficiency, uh, that demand management, how do we drive that down? And then the third leg uh, being our local supplies. How do we grow our local supplies with all that entails of recycling, uh, groundwater cleanup, uh, restoration of, um, of the groundwater basins and stormwater capture. That basic approach has served us pretty well. Uh, in 1990, we imported uh, roughly 2.4 million acre feet of water for 14 million people. And today, we sold about 1.8 million acre feet of imported water for 19 million people. So we've been able to lower our needs for imported water while growing uh, our population and growing our economy. So that approach has worked well for the last 25 years, and our planning indicates we believe we can do this for the next 25 years. But it does require investments in all three prongs, continued ongoing investment in all three of them. And among those is, of course, in imported water. Imported water is under siege by all sorts of issues. We have uh, climate change, primarily probably the, the toughest issue, Endangered Species Act, growing competing needs. Uh, in 1990, Metropolitan used to get uh, water left on the table from Arizona and Nevada, a significant amount of it, almost half a million acre feet every single year that they hadn't yet grown into. Those days were over. Uh, Arizona and Nevada now use all their entitlements. The upper basin on the Colorado River is growing into it. So we have competing needs for our imported water, as well as all the stresses coming from the environment. But we've had, but by thoughtful investments into that, we've been able to firm up and keep and maintain that imported water. So on the Colorado River, what we've done is invest in programs with the Palo Verde Irrigation District, the Imperial Irrigation District, uh, far, farm, agriculture to urban transfers, all those to firm up that water supply and allow Metropolitan to keep a full Colorado River aqueduct. Uh, this last decade, Metropolitan has been able to deliver almost a full Colorado River aqueduct, despite the fact that California as a whole has uh, basically cut about 10% of its Colorado River water use, almost 15%, was cut off from California as we've had to reduce to make room for Arizona and Nevada to grow into their use. So that ongoing investment has enabled us to keep our Colorado River supplies. A uh, question on the table now for California is are we gonna do the same thing with the State Water Project? What you talked about in the beginning, Fritz, with the California water fix, that's the big issue right now on the table. We all know moving water, trying to shove it through the delta, through that maze of canals, simply isn't sustainable. It's not going to work. It puts our entire economy at risk. And the question is, what's the best engineering physical solution to get around that? Well, after about 10 years of study, they've settled on building tunnels that would go underneath it and be a bypass to the, to the delta system. This bypass, Cal Water Fix, uh, $15 billion, is teed up right now for actual decision point. Uh, we've been worked, we worked through the entire Obama administration without getting to a decision point, but the decision point is here and now. Uh, likely in the next uh, two to three weeks, we expect to see completion of the biological opinions from the National Marine Fisheries Service and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. That is the last prerequisite to then completing the environmental review, which is the uh, signing of a record of decision by the Secretary of the Interior, um, Secretary Ryan Zinke. Uh, they have told us, the Trump administration has told us they expect to be able to make that step in the next 30 days. Uh, so this will be a rather, this'll, this will be a huge, significant milestone. Uh, California has wrestled with this for generations. Uh, we talked about 1982, the peripheral canal vote. Uh, this administration and the Brown administration are prepared to complete the environmental review uh, in probably in the next 30 days. At that point, the decision then comes to us, water agencies. What are we going to do? Are we willing to fund this? Are we willing to step up and say, the administrations have cleared the deck for us to go build this? They're not putting money on the table, 
sadly, but they are putting, uh, they are giving us the green light to go ahead and go build a project that would make sense. And then we have to decide, are we willing to fund it? So we are going to walk through that process with our board, look at the costs, look at the benefits, uh, see the true value to Metropolitan and Southern California, and then take that to our board of directors for a decision. Our game plan is to do that in roughly the fall timeframe, around September or so, and make that decision. You will see this process um, mirrored as we go through the state. You'll see Kern County Water Agency, the Westlands Water District, uh, Old Tulare, all these areas are going to have to start making decisions up and down the state, Santa Clara, the Bay Area, Oakland. These are all participants potentially in this project. And then we have to decide, are we gonna fund it and are we going to build this and move it forward? A uh, very serious time, very uh, significant discussion and that's going to obviously consume my summer and uh, hopefully a lot of your summers as well and then get to that point where we can make a decision on it. But very exciting, California has wrestled with this. Uh, it was originally proposed in the 1930s to build it. It was passed, it was too expensive, it was the depression. 1960, it was part of the State Water Project with Pat Brown, again, too expensive, let's do it in the future. 1982, uh, the Peripheral Canal vote on it failed. Um, Governor Duke Magian with Duke's Ditch failed. And now we have Jerry Brown for a second bite at the apple with Cal Water Fix. So for the perhaps in almost 100 years, five different runs at this solution, uh, we have something teed up, ready to go. And this will be, uh, this next uh, 90 days or so will be the key decision point on it. So stay tuned, stay engaged, uh, talk to your water districts, and we'll, we'll see how this goes. But in the meantime, the, everything else in that portfolio approach, we still have to do invest in them all. And we have to be realistic. This $15 billion investment, Metropolitan's share, three and a half, four billion dollars of that, it's not about getting a, a big new water supply so we can stop investing in conservation or local supplies. It's about firming up the reliability of what we have, making that necessary investment for the future, and knowing that you have to make those investments and you have to make those in all supplies going forward. And that's sort of the sobering message we have to deliver to all our boards and to our districts as we go forward. So those are my 10 minutes, and thank you very much. I'm Randy Fiorini. It's uh, great to be here. I see some familiar faces, and um, it's, uh, it, it's a unique opportunity for me to be a part of a seminar that's talking about long-range planning and thinking, because at the Delta Stewardship Council, that's our primary job, to take the long-term view and to establish a roadmap for California to achieve greater water supply reliability and an improved ecosystem in the Delta. Fritz, I really appreciate the overview that you provided this morning. Excellent job. I, I work full time at trying to explain the situation in California, and I've never seen a better summary than you provided today. So, a great way to set the stage. And Dr. Sedlak has stretched your thinking beyond the immediate concerns to consider what future actions can be taken to improve water supply reliability for California. At the Delta Stewardship Council, we were created uh, in the 2009 Delta Reform Act as a new approach to governance. There are over 200 local, state, and federal agencies that have some level of responsibility or regulatory authority for the way things are operated in the Delta, which is the hub or the switchyard for water delivered to some 25 million Californians. It's a very key part of the, of the larger water system. We were, we were directed to develop a comprehensive long-range management plan with a view unto the year 2100. And we were given a number of directives as to what should be included in that plan. We adopted the plan in May of 2013 and then shifted our efforts to working cooperatively Got it. Yep, it works now. Okay, so we are attempting to work cooperatively with a number of the agencies that now have responsibility for carrying out the recommendations that are included in that Delta plan. 
recommendations uh, directed at water conservation, water reuse, enlarging and improving storage, improving conveyance, actions in the delta related to ecosystem restoration, water quality improvements uh, in the delta, uh, risk management, levy improvements, all of these things are included in this comprehensive management plan. I want to talk to you briefly about a, a three initiatives that are currently underway at the Delta Stewardship Council. In the statute, we were told to promote options for conveyance, storage, and operations. For the last two years, we've been working on um, an amendment to the Delta plan and have held monthly meetings with uh, two to three, sometimes 400 people attending, wanting to address what's included in that list of recommendations. It's pretty controversial because for the first time, a state agency has come out and said that we need an isolated conveyance facility in addition to the way we currently move water through the delta. That isolated conveyance facilities should be underground as opposed to above ground, and it should include multiple intakes. Sounds a lot like water fix, but that's not what we're promoting. Again, we promote the uh, long-range vision. If water fix fails, what's next? So the recommendations that we're promoting are more general. They're not um, project specific, but um, because of the opposition to the Twin Tunnels, primarily from the Delta residents, it, our work has created uh, a lot of act uh, reaction. We get a lot of credit at the Stewardship Council for being a very transparent, open, we have monthly meetings, uh, and we're working through this controversy, but on June 22nd, uh, the council will be asked to endorse the current draft, which is I think in its fifth iteration, uh, to move it then to CEQA. Uh, included in that is also recommendations for storage, and the operations component of the recommendations are really the most important because nowhere else have we talked about how to improve conveyance, improve storage, and then link those two together in an operational plan that uh, adjusts to the climate change that we're facing. The, the large systems, the state and the federal water systems, historically have been operated to supplement dry year supplies in this area and other parts of the state. That's been turned on its head because of the conflicts of, in the ecosystem between fish and water. Uh, now the system needs to take advantage of surplus water in the system and without adequate storage, that's impossible. So what we're promoting is uh, a future that includes a, a storage above and below the delta so that surplus water to the ecosystem can be stored and utilized and in, in supplement dry year in-stream flows in support of the fisheries and for human consumption. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do, but it's very hard to get, find consensus among stakeholders, and uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job. I think we're making some progress. The other issue the legislature asks us to do, and we've been working on this for almost four years, is to help the state prioritize the uh, investments in levy improvements in the Delta. Two-thirds of the levies in the Delta are privately owned. Over the last 30 years or more, three quarters of a billion dollars of state money has been applied to local reclamation districts in support of maintenance and in some cases improvements of those Delta levies. The Department of Water Resources and the Central Valley Flood Protection Board have direct responsibilities for that. But in our plan, we're amending it to include very specific guidelines as to how state money should be invested. It's a risk analysis approach. We included the RAND Corporation to help develop a database and a decision support tool. Very, very sophisticated stuff. Uh, for a very, very important issue. You heard earlier from um, speakers that our vulnerability in the water system really is at the delta level. Some of those levees are 150 years old that are made with native soil, which is akin to peat moss. Um, they're not gonna last forever. 
And, uh, but over the next 20 to 30 years, we need to make some considerable investments and be very strategic about where we put those to protect lives, property, water supply, water quality. The last thing that I'll mention very briefly that we're working on is to, in, to determine how effective this long-range comprehensive management plan is, we need to develop performance measures. Defining specific metrics for the outcomes of a number of the initiatives that we're recommending is very, very hard. Uh, I had no idea how hard it would be to assign specific metrics. But that, um, that work is about done, and so hopefully on June 22nd, we're going to wrap up a package of um, levy investment strategy amendments, conveyance storage and operation amendments, with performance measures to move onto the CEQA process. I grew up on a farm. This, this government stuff is, is, is very new and in many ways strange to me. I'm used to making decisions and getting things done. Uh, the, the public stakeholder driven process that we're involved in is the right thing to do, but it is very hard to do. Uh, it's an honor to be here and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, my name is Dave Gutierrez. If I could have the slides for the Orville. Project. So um, let's see, we're already in trouble here. I get 10 minutes. I think I got a, there we go, 15 minutes. That's good. Okay. So I'm going to give you a very uh, quick overview of uh, Orville Dam. I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened. I'll get through that quickly and then kind of where does it go from there. Let's see here. How does this thing go? <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's first get the settings here. This is Orville Dam. It's about a 700 foot high earth fill dam. Uh, a couple of key components over there on the right hand lower part of the picture is the Hyatt power plant. That actually gets the water out of Warville down and gets through a, what's called a tail race. That eventually sets the water through into the Feather River. Another key component is what's called the flood control outlet. It's also sometimes called the gated structure, the gated outlet, and that's what actually controls the reservoir, and that's really the main spillway. And then the other feature is the emergency spillway you've heard a lot about, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is. But that feature is only supposed to be used uh, during very, very large storms, and it's really the last ditch effort to save the, the, the dam in a major flood. Uh, next slide. Okay, so let's get a setting here. What were the weather conditions this year? I think you've heard to, you've already heard the fact that this was one of the wettest years on record. And so typically California gets three or so what they call atmospheric rivers a year on average. And so these are, these are the water producers that actually get us the water that actually we're able to store into the future. Well, in this particular year, each one of those area, each one of those arrows is an atmospheric river that hit this year. So we are way beyond the type of weather conditions that we normally hit. And this is actually a very significant factor uh, in how the reservoir is managed uh, during that emergency. Um, so on February 7th, uh, uh, a situation was noticed, uh, the water coming down the spillway. Uh, this, was, this is a typical operation. About 50,000 CFS were coming down, or the operators were going up to about 50,000 CFS. And you do that to manage the reservoir. This is very typical. It happens about every other year, every third year or so. And so that was happening. Water was coming down the, the spillway, and something strange was noticed with the flow. So they immediately shut off the water and uh, voila, we noticed a hole in the spillway, which is obviously a significant issue. And so the first thing you have to ask yourself, well, can you just fix that hole? And the answer was no, it's just too big. And so the first thing you do is you set up what's called the uh, Incident Command Center. And you gotta understand that there was actually a lot of emergencies going on in the state of California at the time. So you have a state operations center all the way through the department's operations center and then the uh, Orville Field Division. So a couple of key points on this is one, this, this uh, emergency was being operated with all of the other emergencies that were actually going on in the state. And then another key component is your emergency managers, our partners, in this effort. And so a picture of the sheriff there. Remember, the sheriff is the one that handles the emergency management piece of it, while the Department of Water Resources is actually handling the dam and the spillway itself. So it's the sheriff that makes the decision on things such as evacuation, how to evacuate, and where to evacuate to. 
And so the first thing you do when you have such a situation like that is you immediately evaluate it. And so this is a good picture. That last picture shows, well, the hole doesn't look that big, but when you get it a little bit closer and you see those people in the hole, you realize you're probably not gonna fix that in a day or two. And so uh, you gotta make a decision right off the bat. And here's kind of balancing the risk. Here was, here's what the director and some of the other folks were actually thinking through when we were trying to think through this emergency. So the first thing, the picture on the upper left-hand corner there is the spillway itself. You got a hole in your, major, in your main spillway. And the key to that, that is that is the most important structure that you need to save. You cannot allow that concrete to get eroded towards the dam and you cannot allow that, that gated structure at the top of the dam to actually get lost. If, if that happens, uh, then you're gonna have major disasters. So that's number one you're balancing. Number two that you're balancing is, is actually the hydrograph, the hydrology. Very, very coincidental that the day that that hole uh, appeared, uh, one day later, we were anticipating one of the biggest storms on record. In fact, it turned out to be uh, the biggest storm in 20 years. And so you're gonna, you see a storm coming, Again, you don't have time to deal with that hole right away because one of the biggest storms ever is on its way. Uh, another balance that you have to deal with is the emergency spillway. You never want that emergency spillway to activate. In fact, it was, it was predicted, everybody knew that if that emergency spillway were ever to activate, uh, there's gonna be a lot of debris into the river. Now, uh, for that reason, you don't want that emergency spillway to operate and there was never intention for that emergency spillway to operate. Another issue is actually the power lines. There's actually a power line just adjacent to the spillway where the hole was. If you lose that power line, you're gonna lose the actual Hyatt power plant. If you lose the Hyatt power plant, that's gonna be out for nine or 12 months, and you're not gonna be able to actually operate that reservoir for the rest of the year. So that's another issue that you have to deal with. And then finally, the Hyatt power plant itself. If a lot of debris starts coming down the river and you clog up that tail race, it's gonna actually flood that higher power plant. And again, you will not be able to operate that reservoir. So you're trying to make a decision based on all these variables and you got about five or 10 minutes to make these decisions. And so this is kind of what these folks were kind of going through at the time. And another issue I think that, that was happening at the time is the prediction of the hydrograph. So, uh, our weather folks are so good in, in uh, determining how, what kind of weather is going to come in. And so we were making predictions. And the prediction was the, the graph is going to peak at about 120,000 CFS into the reservoir. Under those conditions, we felt, okay, let's open up the spillway. Let's let 50,000 CFS go. We're going to be just fine. About two hours later, that prediction went from 120,000 to 140,000 CFS. Yeah, we're losing a little bit of our factor of safety, but we're still okay. About two hours later after that, the prediction's now 160,000 CFS. Okay, we're gonna be at the lip. We're gonna barely make it, but we're still gonna be okay. By the time this was all done, the actual peak inflow is about 190,000 CFS, which is the reason why the water actually went over the emergency spillway, which again, was never really planned. Now getting into the damages, you heard a lot about the damages uh, beneath the actual emergency spillway. These damages were caused by uh, erosion of rock. And so again, we all knew that there would be debris into the river. Everybody knew that was gonna happen. This emergency spillway was not going to be kicked in until there was about 270,000 CFS coming down the main spillway. That was the original design. And under those conditions, the levees downstream are not capable of actually handling that type of flow. So again, this emergency spillway is only gonna be kicked in when we're already in trouble in the Sacramento Valley. Uh, but what happened here is not only did the debris go downstream, it actually started plucking the rock and going towards the emergency spillway, which you're trying to prevent that failure. You cannot allow that, that failure of the emergency spillway, which is actually a concrete structure just adjacent to the dam. And so these damages were uh, a result of that. And then the other damage was the actual, uh, the actual main spillway. So there's what's called shear zones. Shear zones, and we all know about the shear zones coming through the spillway, and that's why actually you put a concrete structure there. You're trying to get over to this soft rock. It's rock, but it's soft rock. And so once that hole started getting created, the path that it found is this uh, shear zone, and it eroded all that into the river downstream. And I'd like you to kind of keep an eye on the block, the little blocks there at the end of the uh, spillway there, because I think you need to get a better sense of the magnitude of this issue. 
So those little blocks that I pointed out, those are people right next to those little blocks. So that gives you a better indication of the magnitude of this uh, spillway and how large it really is. And so uh, additional damages are the fact that this debris, so all that debris that actually was in the spillway came down into the river and clogged the river. And so there were some problems with that. The problems are if you get all that debris into the river, then you're going to back that tail race up, which is going to cause the actual Hyatt Power Plant to flood, which actually almost happened. We had about five or six feet of, of potential water into the Hyatt Power Plant. If that were to flood, again, we're going to lose that, that Hyatt Power Plant for about a year. We're not going to be able to actually manage that reservoir throughout the summer uh, and the, the spring and the summer. And so, um, what did we do uh, right after the emergency? Uh, there were several things that actually happened. Uh, first of all, saving the Hyatt power plant. That was one of the most important things to do. You had to remove all that debris out of the river. Uh, first, first go at it, uh, we were told you got about 1.9 million cubic yard of debris into the river. Um, and it's going to take us about nine months to get that debris out. That was not acceptable. The director ordered uh, a lot of equipment from pretty much all over the country and that debris was moved in about two weeks. Uh, the Hyatt power plant had to be saved. Uh, some folks at the Department of Water Resources, the operators at the time, uh, during the emergency, everyone was evacuated except those folks. They actually went down to the bottom of the dam to actually save that power plant. So what they did is they basically put up sandbags, et cetera, so that that water, that water backup water from the tail race doesn't get into the high power plant. So those folks actually saved that power plant as a result of uh, their efforts. Some other emergency, uh, uh, right, after the, uh, right after the event, of course, we're still in February. We have February, March, April to go. There's still a lot of poss possibilities of storms to come in. And so there was some emergency repairs on that emergency spillway with the intent that this would never be used again this year and hopefully never again, but we're still in February. And in fact, this being the wettest year on record, um, we passed about five and a half million acre feet of water over a broken spillway. So a broken spillway passed more water than this spillway has ever seen uh, in its history. Uh, and then finally over there on the, uh, the right-hand side picture, remember that tower right next to the spillway. If that thing falls down, it's going to tear down the rest of the towers, the rest of the lines. We're going to lose power to Chico, but just as important, we're going to, again, we're going to lose the high power plant for the rest of the year. So right away, we rerouted the wires and rerouted that tower uh, so that there would be a, a, a different path uh, for the power to come in and out of the power plant. And so emergency recovery uh, repairs are already underway. So this is record time. Uh, a lot has to be done. I've worked actually on projects actually fairly similar to this, where we've rebuilt spillways, where we built spillways almost of this size, not quite. Uh, and uh, those projects usually take us about 10 years to do. By the time you actually do a concept, by the time you actually get the funding, by the time you go through the environmental documents, well, we don't have 10 years. We have about six months. So that is why a lot of the, uh, a lot of the requirements were actually suspended because we don't have time. We have to get this spillway up and running by November 1st so it could pass next year's storms. And so typically designs that take two, three years, they were done in about one or two months. They're already actually complete. They're getting approved right now. Uh, we got a contractor in place in a matter of weeks instead of a matter of uh, months as well. The contractor was on site within uh, a day or two with 150 folks uh, from all over the country uh, already working on this. So they've already started. Uh, they've actually already uh, taken out most of the existing spillway that's going to, that was left, uh, still damaged, but left, so I'll, pretty much that's gone. Uh, we're already starting to place concrete, I think, this week. So we're moving along, uh, and we'll see how far we get. There's kind of a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, and a plan D. And that's because you don't know in construction, something always goes wrong. It never goes exactly as planned. And so again, we got to get that structure ready by uh, November 1st. Now kind of switching to, well, where does this leave us with the rest of the country? And aging dams, national issue, state issue. Uh, and I like to think of aging dams. When we talk about aging dams, think of people usually we're getting older. Well, I don't like to think about that in terms of dams. It's not so, it's not so much, although it's a part, the fact that the dam, the structure is aging, 
it's more important the fact that these structures will not, were not built to today's standards. Orville's a perfect example of that. We would not build that spillway today like they did in 1969. And so that is an issue, not only here, that's an issue across the country. And so the graph there shows pretty much the age of dams throughout the state of California. Over half of the dams in the state of California, and there's 1,250 of them, are over 50 years old. And a quarter of those are 100 years old. And so it's not the fact that they're just aging, it's the fact that they're not built to the standards of today. And to replace all those today's standards is probably cost prohibitive. But we have to struggle. So that's the bad news. Um, the good news is there is efforts going on, especially here in California. So for about 10 or 15 years, I, together with the Association of State Dam Safety Officials and the American Society of Civil Engineers, we fought pretty hard to get actually a National Dam Safety Rehabilitation Act. It took 15 years or so to convince Congress to pass that act. And in December, it was actually passed. So that was just authorization. Now we'll actually see if there's appropriation to actually start funding the repairs of dams throughout the, uh, throughout the country. So we're, we're starting to move in the right direction. Here in California, uh, we have actually been very successful in making repairs. Over the last 10 or 15 years, we've made over a billion dollars of repairs to dams statewide. Did we catch everything? Obviously not. Uh, uh, Orville's uh, had that problem. Do we have a long way to go? Absolutely. But you're always limited by the resources. You're limited by how fast you can move. Uh, but we're making progress. We have made about a billion dollars of progress. We got another billion dollars on the books right now to continue repairing these old, st old structures that were designed uh, to uh, lesser standards. Uh, switching over to levees, um, again, same problem, aging infrastructure. Again, it's not so much that it's aging, it's built in a standard that we certainly wouldn't build a levee like we, we did back in the early 1900s where we used clamshells and dumped whatever we got out of the river into the side. Yet, we're living with those, uh, we're, we're living with those type of levees throughout the Central Valley, throughout the Delta. You heard a lot about that today. And so uh, our levee infrastructure needs uh, some help too. We've seen a lot of levee failures uh, over the years. There's actually hundreds of levee failures. There's, uh, there is some light, there is a little bit of positive and that is uh, not too long ago, a few years ago, we had Flood Safe California. So that was a $5 billion investment in our levee program uh, throughout generally the Central Valley to start improving uh, levees throughout the state. Is that enough? Did we get there? No, we still got a long way to go, but at least we're making uh, some, some direction on that. And then uh, groundwater. It's not really a piece of infrastructure, but I think groundwater is absolutely a critical component to our overall water supply. And so um, we have some problems again, and the problems are uh, when you look around the state and you look at how much groundwater we've been using over the decades, uh, Orange County is really the exception and not the rule. Orange County has done a great job understanding and, and developing and investing into their groundwater program. The rest of the state, not necessarily so good. We have many places in the Central Valley that have lost hundreds of feet of, of water levels over the last uh, century. Uh, along with that, the ground has subsided up to amounts of 30 or so feet. And so we definitely have some problems uh, with our groundwater. And whatever we do with our groundwater is absolutely gonna, gonna uh, affect our water supply overall. That's the bad news. The good news is we have a new program called the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which is finally starting to address groundwater statewide. And that's gonna actually have such as a huge, in my opinion, a huge impact on water supply for the first time we're actually adding that last piece of the equation to the water supply situation, and that is groundwater. Uh, groundwater, along with surface water, uh, snow, et cetera, you have to add that together to actually understand what you have. And so the first time ever, I think we're actually going to uh, start to address that, and it will have a, a, a significant effect on our overall water supply because we're actually starting to count that in our checkbook. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. So, Jeff, I got a question before you walk out. How come you get the guy that talks all about disasters and you follow him with the guy that was on the Trump campaign? 
I mean, I'm just, I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Um, good morning and thank you all very much. I'm Scott Mason. I'm from Washington. I'm here to help. Right? I mean, you've all heard that, you've all heard that before. I'm going to come over here to the podium because I've got 75 pages of speech that, um, that y'all can just settle in for. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, by the way, I'm the guy on the left. So, lest there be any confusion. Fritz, how am I doing? Okay, thank you. So, well, it's, it's, it, you, comedy is a very dangerous place to go with a guy that's actually a professional at it. But, but now having been on stage with a, a, a weathercaster and a PhD from Berkeley, I have officially met or exceeded both of my parents' expectations. <laughs> so, so I'll let y'all figure out which, which one had expectations of, of, of where I may be, but that's where I am. So, um, I did, so from, briefly, from 2005 to 2015, um, I was Vice President of Government Affairs for Lowe's Home Improvement Companies. Um, ultimately, they eventually acquired Orchard Supply and Hardware, which many of y'all as Californians are very familiar with. Um, we worked on a lot of issues. We worked on a lot of water efficiency issues, including support for the Water Sense program that I think from a, uh, from a faucet and showerhead and uh, sprinkler perspective, um, quite frankly, uh, I'm not necessarily the biggest fan of the EPA, but they actually run some really good programs in the public-private partnership space. Energy Star and Water Sense being among them. So in um, the spring of last year, for a moment of insanity, um, I had the opportunity to join the campaign as Director of Congressional Affairs. Um, so it was, needless to say, an exciting uh, venture. Um, probably, I, I think I just, I did it because I thought, well, it's going to be a hell of a ride. And Lord knows it was. Um, the first few months I was on the campaign, we had little Marco, we had Lion Ted, we had little hands, which would eventually turn out to be the least of our problems. Um, you know, but we were headed to Cleveland, and I'll give you a little bit of background on the campaign and then sort of where the administration is today and where they're going. But we were headed to Cleveland for what was to believe, believed to be a, a contested convention. Um, then we had a good Tuesday night in May, and um, we became the presumptive nominee. And literally in the course of about 24 hours, we shifted the entire campaign. Um, we continued along with the anti-establishment message. We continued along with the anti-Washington message. But when you have a man that's running for president of the United States that may be not as deep on policy as you might like your candidate to be, you had to get your policy from somewhere. So we worked very closely with members of Congress. Um, we developed a contingent of about 150 members of the House Republican Conference. We never got to unanimity. Um, we were looking for some form of unity. Um, but that was where a lot of our policy issues came from. That was where a lot of the information came from. So on immigration issues, on health care issues. You know, there are a number of doctors in the House of Representatives. Um, so we consulted with them on, on the pros and cons and, and what was good in the ACA. Um, you know, obviously regulatory reform in this administration is hugely critical uh, to the direction that they're going to go. Um, by and large, to some degree, to do, due to the dysfunction, quite frankly, in the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. Um, the good thing was that while we were not perfect as a campaign or a candidate, we were not running against perfection either. So that was sort of the blessing that we could always rely on. So we didn't have to be perfect. We just had to find some way to communicate to the American public and let the voters decide. And ultimately on November 8th, they chose change. They chose not to continue a family political dynasty. And you could say that that was true of the Bushes and the Clintons. And even in the Senate level, you know, Indiana, Evan Bayh ran for re-election in the Senate. The Bayh family is historic in Indiana. Um, and yet because of the fact, I think, largely that he was part of that oligarchy, if you will. Um, the voters rejected that. So that's where we ended up. Uh, 306 electoral votes. There's a lot of red states in the middle. There's some blue states on the left and the right. Um, it's an interesting time in Washington. Um, the Senate is made up of a 52 narrow Republican majority, 52-48. Um, got to update that a little bit. Um, you know, without 60 votes in the United States Senate, it's difficult to do a lot of things. 
Um, I will say that as it relates to infrastructure projects, um, there are huge opportunities for California to work with the administration. Infrastructure opportunities are not as partisan as other issues. Uh, the president, look, at the end of the day, likes shiny things. Roads, bridges, airports, ports, infrastructure projects, water projects, energy projects. Um, find a way in Washington to work with your representatives, your members of the Senate, uh, and, and find a path forward. Um, there has been a lot of talk about the trillion dollar infrastructure package. A lot of questions about why we couldn't lead with that. Why couldn't that come first? Well, because there are some members in the House Republican Commons that quite simply want to pay for things. $19 trillion of debt is enough for them. So if you do health care first, if you do tax reform, and you generate some of those additional revenues for the government, eventually you get to the point that you can pay for that infrastructure package. It has obviously not worked out the way they planned. <laughs> Um, and that will remain a challenge. Um, 2018, you've got 33 members of the Senate up for re-election, 25 Democrats, only eight Republicans. The eight Republicans are from pretty solid red states. Uh, there are a few Democrats that will be challenged electorally, uh, how they work with the White House and, 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 and the messages that they convey in the next 18 months will be critical to their success. Um, Several of them are from red states, Trump states, if you will. Um, so we'll see how that works out. And that may be that. Um, but I think the, the, uh, the thing from an infrastructure perspective is this. When you go to Washington, and, and I know that some of the organizations and water districts here have already, um, that is critically important, number one that your voice be heard. So thank you for participating in the process. Um, but emphasize the thing this administration is looking for, they're looking for data. They're looking for facts. They wanna know the cost. They wanna know the number of jobs it's going to create. They wanna know if there are P3 opportunities out there. They wanna know what their share of the burden is going to be. Uh, and they wanna know what is the long-term lasting impact that the project is going to have to make America, or your slice of it, great again. I mean, I had no hashtag required, but that's a fact. So when you go to the Department of Transportation, who's largely tasked thus far with developing the infrastructure package, triangulate that, so don't talk just to the Department of Transportation about it. Talk to the White House, talk to the Hill. Talk to other agencies, whether it's the Department of Energy, um, Department of Interior, that are working to help support you. I mean, I will tell you that, that Secretary Zinke and Secretary Perry, look, the cabinet secretaries are very frustrated at their inability to accomplish as much as they want to accomplish. And that, and that inability is largely because they have not been able to staff up at the assistant secretary and deputy secretary levels of government. There are hundreds and hundreds of positions waiting for Senate confirmation that will eventually, we hope, allow them to be more effective in their roles. It's going to take a little bit more time. Um, we're only 135 days into this administration, roughly, very early, uh, but they are significantly behind on their appointment status. Uh, that, that hopefully will pick up a little bit this summer. Um, the remaining weeks of the June work period as well as the July work period, uh, so that by Labor Day, um, you know, the assistant secretary, so Fish and Wildlife, um, uh, EPA, um, even the Army Corps, um, you know, will, will be fully functioning. Um, you know, the administration is looking to go a different direction than the last eight years. So from a regulatory relief perspective, find opportunities, make suggestions to them of the regulations at the federal level that they can peel back and assist you with that will help expedite your projects. They're looking for those. They need to know those. Every cabinet secretary has been challenged with developing a list of those regulations, but they need your input. So please communicate that to Washington. 
Um, you know, the EPA, I think we've seen a significant turn. Um, the Army Corps, I know, is critical to a lot of your works. Uh, increasingly, I think they're getting the message that they need to be more business friendly and not be the, the doorstop to economic development, uh, which they've, they've, they've served significantly as for the last eight years. Um, again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I, I grew up on the West Coast, believe it or not, of Florida. Um, and, and so I was, a, I was a Disney World kid. And, uh, and, and, and stole a few hours yesterday and, and snuck into Disneyland. And um, uh, one of the great opportunities I've ever had, a lot of fun. So thank you guys very, very much. Appreciate it, look forward to questions. Thanks, Fritz. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Each one was uh, informative and interesting and we appreciate your participation, each of you great experts and uh, your particular field. Scott, I, I wanted to start with a question for you because I think this is a concern not only for those involved in the water business in Southern California or in California, but those of us who are residents of the state. And you can make us feel better about this. You sort of hinted at it at the okay. beginning of your presentation. We're the world's, we're the country's blue state out here, but we're also one of the great drivers of the American economy. So maybe you can make us feel better about being worried that because of political differences out here, when it comes to spending on infrastructure or approval, approval for various infrastructure projects, that we out here won't be forgotten or will be considered in a, in a, in a lesser fashion. Yeah, no, I, it's a great question. Um, you know, California is certainly not Republican country um, anymore. Um, it used to be. Um, but I think there are examples. I mean, you look, look at all the great support that Senator Feinstein gave to Caltrain, right? And, 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 and you know, okay, so, you know, Northern California issue, um, but, you know, the administration honored the agreement and, um, and, and Caltrain's moving forward. You know, I mean, I think that's sort of a great sign that despite the politics, um, that as large as your economy is, uh, the opportunities here exist, the infrastructure needs obviously exist, um, that I think the administration recognizes that they've got to keep California moving uh, because it, it keeps the western part of the United States alive and moving. Um, and, and let me just talk about infrastructure in a little bit broader role, and that is this, that, that I, I think, I mean, the administration's trying to be creative, believe it or not. They really are. Um, and, and when you talk about a trillion-dollar infrastructure package and you look at the Export-Import Bank, okay, by and large, most people look at it as a subsidy, if you will, so the U.S. companies can compete internationally against international companies that are subsidized by their governments, okay? But this administration's actually found a way that they believe they can pull $25 billion a year from the XM Bank for domestic export-import projects. So what does that mean? Well, we're not that far from the ports of L.A. Long Beach, so let's talk about access, let's talk about egress, let's talk about what can be done dockside domestically um, through those monies. I mean, I, I, you know, so, so I think there is absolutely a willingness of the administration. Um, I think they recognize the value of California, the importance of California, uh, and, and, and they just, it, it just improve communications. Thank you. So Jeff, uh, um if we could go back to pre-drought times like 2007 and learn from our mistakes in hindsight, what would be a couple or three things that we could have done that would have made our acclimation to this drought a little bit easier, both as citizens of California, but also as the water distribution business? Well, as citizens, you know, people, we, we always wondered in, about how much flexibility there is in water use and we picked the low hanging fruit and how much people can conserve more and is there that much room? Uh, I think we we're extremely and pleasantly surprised how much people did conserve during this uh, second round of drought we had in this last decade. Uh, we had a drought from 2004 to 2008 and then a repeat uh, starting again uh, from uh, 13, 12 through 15. So we've had two rounds of drought, and that 12 through 15 period time frame, people really astonishingly dropped their water use, about a whole nother 25 to 35% across the state uh, that 
you know, as a professional in the business, I really didn't think there was that much room left to go. And by and large, haven't really rebounded. So that was one thing. Could have done that earlier, harder, better. But I, I was still incredibly surprised how well that worked. We in the water collection and distribution business, uh, from 2007 to the present, we've been basically just engaged in battling over what is the right amount of pumping, when can you move it, uh, between the fish agencies, we spent the last eight years battling over how to manage the system. Finally, uh, Senator Feinstein, working with um, Speaker McCarthy, uh, passed a bill during the lame duck period that just said, agencies, get together and find something that's more flexible and make it work. A and they did that. Uh, but that took eight years until finally, during this last December, we passed what's called the WIN Act and, and directed the agencies you got to start being flexible. We're in a drought. You have to start making these things work. And that, that has helped. That helped. But it, it's, uh, it took us eight years to get there. Thank you so much. David, so you talked about the catastrophe that was averted up at Oroville. What do you think the greatest threat is, not just to the, tel the Delta area, but the, the whole water delivery system in California? Is it quakes? Is it climate change? If you had to put your finger on the top one or two threats, what would it be? Well, I, I think it depends what structures you're talking about. Um, you know, levees, dams are a little bit different in terms of their threats. So in terms of climate change, I don't really see that as an issue so much for, for dams because they're normally designed for extremely, extremely high floods. Whereas levees, uh, climate change is going to be a major factor. When you're talking about earthquakes, uh, I think uh, maybe two decades ago, we had a serious threat with earthquakes in California to the dams. Uh, that's actually, when I talked about that billion or so dollars that's actually been uh, spent repairing dams, that's been the focus of those repairs because we have dams that were built uh, 100 years ago. They were hundreds of feet off of a fault, and these faults are ready to rupture. We've been very lucky here in California in terms of we haven't had the big earthquake uh, in 100 or 150 or so years. So we've made a lot of progress on the dams. Uh, levees, that's another story. We certainly... Uh, should worry about earthquakes, especially in the Delta. When we had the Loma Prieta quake, that was a small one. That's a little. That was a little. That was earth, yeah, that So was that wasn't a threat to the infrastructure. We just made it in the in the no, fake that, news. We made it seem bigger than it was. No, it was a big one. So that's a that's a magnitude seven earthquake, and uh, what we saw in 1906. That's a magnitude eight eight and a half earthquake, and the difference in energy between a seven and an eight is about 30 times. And so. I don't mean to, uh, to re reduce the importance of the Loma Prieta earthquake, but that's, that's very small compared to what we should be expecting. So no effect on the Delta region or the No effect on the region. Delta. It actually did have a significant effect of one of the major dams uh, in, in San Jose, uh, but uh, it was small uh, in comparison to what I think we're going to be expecting any time, any day. Right. Randy, so a lot of your job, it sounds like, is striking the balance between reality what's pragmatic, and the environmental issues that are uh, super important to us as uh, very proud residents of California. So what, what, are, what are the biggest obstacles in you being able to deliver what your mandate is up there, trying to strike a balance between the two, the, 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 the reality of what's going on and environmental issues? Well, Fritz, there are a number of competing interests. And as an agency that is responsible for trying to coordinate actions, uh, we not only have our federal and state agencies that are responsible for any particularly given matter, but there are other stakeholders. There are water agencies, there are environmental organizations, and, and uh, the viewpoints are coming at this from, from different perspectives. So it's hard to find a middle ground that allows us to move forward. To give you an example, when we adopted the Delta Plan uh, in May of 2013, within 30 days, we were sued by 27 different entities. Uh, about half of those entities were the water community that asserted that we had exercised more authority than the statute had provided. The other half of the folks that sued us were mostly from in Delta and environmental organizations that alleged that we did not e e e apply enough of the authority that we had been given. So, you know, in one respect, we thought, okay, the plan is, is pretty well balanced, but to move forward and to try and, and, and negotiate settlements 
uh, you're negotiating against uh, two uh, opposite points of view. It's, it's difficult, but uh, I, I think we're making progress in terms of levy investment strategies, in terms of describing how uh, conveyance storage should be operated in a sustainable way, addressing the, the threats of climate change and the, the increased variability and precipitation from year to year. Uh, our agency is making some inroads. Awesome. How about some questions from the audience? Cue up at the microphone. Anybody have a question for any of these experts? And while you line up, let me ask a question. Say the Cal water fix gets passed. What are the estimates on how long it would take? About 15 years. 15 years? To, before it's online. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. Larry Forrester, council member of the city of Signal Hill. Also, in full disclosure, on the LA County Sanitation Board. We pump 300,000 gallons of tertiary treatment water one and a half miles out of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. Now, the MWD has a trial project. Can you tell me where that stands to make that infiltrate water? So we, we MWD is a partnership with LA County Sand Districts, and the ultimate goal, if it proves out, is to build a plant that will do about 165,000 uh, acre feet of water a year. It'll be the largest recycled water plant in the West Coast. Right now, we're at a demonstration plant um, project size. We we have built a we are building a 15 million dollar uh, demonstration plant, and then we're going to run it for a couple of years and really test it out, and then eventually, hopefully, move forward to a full implementation project. Probably a decision point in the late 2018 timeframe. Thank you. Yes, sir. Rob Hunter, Municipal, Municipal Water District of Orange County. A uh, question for Jeff Keitlinger. Our ability to use the water, to export the water from the Bay Delta is increasingly impacted by the health of fish populations. We've talked about the California Water Fix, the companion program is Eco Restore. Could you talk for a few minutes on the importance of investment in Eco Restore? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, our our future is a, an ability to use and move water is linked to the, we need the success of the ecosystem and the fisheries. So it's in our great self-interest to make sure the fish populations and the environment and the ecosystem is doing well. Uh, the original plan was to do a habitat conservation plan. Uh, that fell through. The fish agencies decided it was too complicated, and so now we're just doing project by project on that. But we're working well with the fish agencies. Uh, we've started a lot of money investing into the Eco Restore. California passed a water bond. They put several hundred million dollars into projects. We have, if should the uh, Cal Water Fix go forward, there's about a billion and a half dollars set aside in that. $15 billion for ecosystem restoration projects. So there is funding and there is progress being made. And it's, it's in our great self-interest to make sure that that goes and, and works well. Yes. Uh, good morning. Alexander with Congressman Rohrabacher's office. Uh, Mr. Mason, you uh, hinted at the need for uh, the Trump infrastructure project will require a certain significant uh, private industry contribution. Um, how crucial would you say uh, tax reform, uh, how crucial would that be uh, for that goal? And is there a rough uh, timeline of legislative objectives you can hint at? <laughs> yeah, um, great question. Uh, tax reform is gonna be critically important to the infrastructure package. Uh, they, you may actually see, and I think this is an interesting idea from inside the Beltway, and I hate to bore, what, bore, bore you all with that, but you may actually see tax reform and infrastructure go together. Um, that would probably help both in terms of making it a little bit more bipartisan. There are a lot of, unfortunately, there are a lot of parts of Speaker Ryan's ideas with regard to the tax reform package, the border adjustment tax, and again, I hate to bore you all, but that are, it's just quite simply politically unpalatable to those red states in the middle of the country that the president won. Because how do you accomplish corporate tax reform? And whether it's 15% or 20 or, you know, you settle at 25. Um, how do you sell corporate tax reform and tell somebody that goes to Walmart every week for the groceries that it's okay, we've got corporate tax reform, 
no matter that you pay 20% more when you go to the cash register because that's what they do in Europe. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what part of the problem the speaker's not getting on that, but, but this election was not about what, it was not about making America like Europe. <laughs> okay, so the border adjustability tax has just got to go away. Um, but then that's a trillion dollars of, of revenue that they then somehow got to make up for, right? Um, so I, I think there, there are conversations in Washington that the size of tax reform may not be as big as the president had hoped for. Um, I think the administration's in a little bit of a quandary because they delivered a three quarters page piece of paper and said, this, these are our ideas on tax reform. I mean, a, a tax reform bill, I mean, is, you know, you know, and, and, and the congressman knows, are thousands of pages long. It's a little meatier than three quarters of a page. Um, so the administration's got a long way to go before they get there, I think. And, and the speaker does too. All right, time for one last question. Yes, sir. Hi, um, excuse me. There we go, that's better. My name's Fred Ajarian. I'm a director at El Toro Water District, and I think Jeff knows what I'm gonna ask here. It's about sustainable infrastructure. Uh, I've long had a passion about the fact that a lot of attention, as it should be, is given to our water resources, but not enough attention is given to the preservation, uh, restoration, maintenance, uh, save our underground infrastructure. We'll have all this lovely water, but not, not facilities that are aging quickly like me and, and not getting any better with, with age. So the question I would pose to the, to the group is, is there any consideration being given at either at the state level, and I'm looking at David, because I posed the same question to uh, uh, Bill Croyle uh, about uh, Oroville, or anywhere else, perhaps at Met, uh, Jeff, to consider the use of smart infrastructure. The, the technology is there, it's been discussed, it's been, it's in, in action in the UK. University of Cambridge put forth this idea. It's basically using the monitoring uh, technology that we've got, uh, embedding it uh, to provide real-time data in any infrastructure you wish, whether it's a spillway at Oroville, the large diameter pipes that MET has, to give you real-time, up-to-the-minute, current status on where your infrastructure is at to help facilitate and perhaps uh, avoid some of potential uh, issues. So question is, is smart infrastructure going to be considered being done at the, uh, with sewer lids? Good friend of mine, smart cover technology. So that's the question, anyone? Um, so actually I think, yeah, United States is a bit behind on smart, um, uh, smart monitoring, et cetera. But, but there, are, there are facilities that actually are starting to do that. There are actually uh, live, live monitoring of certain structures, certainly in dams and levees, but a lot of it's uh, still also in kind of the research mode here in the United States. We're just, we're just not caught on, certainly in dams and levees and things like that. Uh, but I think it, it, it's, gotta, it's gotta catch on sooner or later. It's gotta move forward. Uh, we do have to invest in that technology. We got to get better at what we're doing. Uh, we have to learn from our mistakes and we should be applying new technology like uh, I think some of the things you're mentioning. Let me, let me just add from the federal perspective on this, um, Secretary Zinke and I have talked about this and, and, and their belief is that there's really not a water collection problem per se. There's a retention and distribution problem. And they recognize that there are thousands of miles of canals and ditches across the country that we just lose, quite simply, too much water, right? So I think when you look at a, a federal infrastructure package, um, there's absolutely positively a, a water component to it that will include retention and distribution. Now, they don't believe that. They don't believe no from the federal government perspective <laughs> that it's their job to get it to the house, but they want to get it down the middle of the street and then let y'all deal with taking it the last mile. I think that was meant for me. Thank you for your comments. Would you, <laughs> would you please give our guests a round of applause? Jeff Keitlinger, Randy Fiorini, Dave Gutierrez, and Scott Mason. Thank you, gentlemen.
Of the 51 priority infrastructure projects submitted by Governor Brown to the administration for funding, 14 are water projects. These guys are up here and they can't do it alone. We look to all of you here today to let members of Congress and the administration know that it's very important that California gets its fair share of funding to help sustain California's water supplies, which in turn help our nation's economy to thrive. Thank you again, gentlemen. We're going to take a 10 to 15 minute break. When you hear the sound of under the sea, come back to your seats. <laughs>